So a few months ago, I made a video where I sat down and I read some of my books that I had written when I was a child. And in that video, I said that I had some other projects that I would be willing to share with you from like later on. And so here we are, and we are going to do that today. The book that I will be reading from you today is the first book that I ever like sat down and completed as like an actual book. I remember I tried to write books a lot when I was like 12 or 13, but like that never really happened. It would be something where I would like write like a chapter or like come up with a concept and a title and then I would write a couple of sentences or a few paragraphs and then I would just scrap it. I was never really motivated to write. That was never something that I did very often but it was in 2014 when I had learned about NaNoWriMo which stands for National Novel Writing Month where your goal is to write 50,000 words within the month. So me being some stupid 14 year old at that time was like Let's freaking do it! Which unfortunately resulted in a terrible book that we're gonna be reading today. I plotted this when I was 13 and wrote it when I was 14. And the idea that I came up with was entitled Ruler of the Stars, which I actually think is a really good title, and I'm actually kind of proud of myself for coming up with that title because it sounds cool. Um, but this book followed a 18-year-old girl, and I would tell you her real name, but fun fact about this name, I came up with this name, and I actually really liked this name. I still really like this name. But I wrote this character in this book, but then when I, like a year after I wrote this, decided that this book sucked, I was like, but I still like this name, so then I took the name and put it to a different character in a different book of mine. And that's like actually a project that I still really like and have been working really hard on. So I don't want to tell you her real name, but I will randomly off the top of my head give you a name just so we can refer to her as something in this video. Off the top of my head, we'll call her Mary Sue. Yikes to that. We're gonna get into it, and I'm not gonna read like my actual full manuscript because uh, it's freaking long. I mean, for like an actual book, it's not that long. It's only 58,000 words. I think in an actual book, that would be around like 200 pages. So I'm gonna be reading you like cringy lines. I'm gonna try to catch you up with the story as much as possible, but like I'm gonna be skimming some stuff. So we begin. Part one. I like this because I formatted, I don't know if you can see that, probably not, frick. But I formatted my book to look like an actual book because I was like 14. I was like, ooh, I'm an, uh, I'm an author. I'm gonna get this published. I'm gonna be a teen author. No. I started out my book with a um, part one and there is a quote under it. Let's read the quote that I chose. To say that one waits a lifetime for his soulmate to come around is a paradox. People eventually get sick of waiting take a chance on someone, and by the art of commitment, become soulmates, which takes a lifetime to perfect. You might be asking yourself, Caleb, what in fact does that even mean? I don't know. I, I just think that I was trying to be cool and edgy, but it didn't work. But let's move on to chapter one. Oh gosh, I'm already regretting this. And by the way, I haven't gone back and read this in like two or three years, so I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> I'm scared. The huge door lifts over my blonde head and the loud cheers begin. They shake my body and nearly knock me down. I really don't want to be here. I don't try to be ungrateful for what I have, but I can't help it. Being normal for once in my life would be great. Mary Sue, Mary Sue. My name is like a song in the air around me. The people scream and cheer for me. It feels impossible for them to look up to me so much. I'm Mary Sue, the loved princess. I'm Mary Sue, the sophisticated queen to be. I am an 18 year old girl. Why do they care so much? So to update you on what's going on, I have been reading this and it doesn't seem that interesting, which is just a great way to start out your book, right? So since it's this chick's 18th birthday, she's basically given the task of creating a law for the people, right? It's basically so that the people will see that like the leadership is, you know, being passed on, like a passing of the baton or whatever to the next generation, almost to prove that she is like a worthy leader or whatever. She's standing out um, in front of all the people and she's going to a announce her new law that's gonna go into effect. Hello, you all know me. I'm Princess Mary Sue. Today is my 18th birthday. More cheers from the crowd. I see a man lift his son onto his shoulders and I smile at them and try to continue with my speech. That's what I thought was imagery. Just really needed to know about that son. So with that being said, it is time for my law. For those of you who are unaware, it is mandatory for the children of the king and queen to make a new law that can help the kingdom from all types of poverty and pain. 
Oh gosh. It is done to show the leadership that will come from the future leaders of Arlington. Uh, the country is called Arlington. Um, and I remember while I was writing, I reached this weird thing where I realized that the country was called Arlington. Um, but then I actually didn't know what the planet was called. So it is time for my law to become in act. I think that's proper grammar, but I think it could have been written better. After 12 o'clock midnight, it will be in full force and any disobedience of this law will result in a dungeon sentence or even death. Like we're starting out on page three and this chick is already like bringing down the uh, guillotine, you know what I'm saying? Ooh, way to go, girl. I smile into my microphone. What an amazing day. After she says that she's gonna kill them, what a queen, am I right? <laughs> There's just a lot of boring stuff. Okay, here we are, Never mind. Okay, here we go. <laughs> We're on page four and literally nothing's happened. She says, my law to show you my future leadership is that all types of space travel will become illegal in Arlington. I slow my speech as soon as I say it. Oh wait, so she's saying it like, is that space travel will be illegal in all of Arlington. Okay, <laughs> she says, because she's the best ever, right? She says, I don't know why shutting off space travel can help us end poverty or sickness, but my father told me that's what I have to do. What a good queen. You're taking away the rights of the people, which I just feel like is the opposite of what you should be doing here, Mary Sue, but go off, I guess. Now, now, before anyone freaks out about losing their jobs or losing a way of transportation, most of those who work in the space supplies industry, what is that? <laughs> space supplies? I think I meant like shipping stuff off to other planets and stuff, but... The space supplies industry. Few of the workers will be laid off and found new work. If you own a spaceship, it will be taken from you, but you will receive a small amount of income depending on the ship's model. A lot of boring explanation here that goes on for way too long, but also way too short because we're on page four. Like she's taking away people's jobs, taking away people's rights, and that's just the end of it. And my favorite thing is, is that it's never resolved. Like I would understand if she had like a change of heart halfway through the book and was like, we're getting rid of this. But no, she's just never ever doing that ever. So even though earlier she just said that her father is forcing her to do this and that she has no idea why, a paragraph later she's updating about why she's doing this and why this law needs to happen. She says, <laughs> this is funny, one of the questions you may be asking is why I created this law. Well, many of you know, dot dot dot, dare I even speak the name, dot dot dot. Benson. <laughs> That's like the least threatening name ever. Like instead of it being like some dark mysterious name, it's like Benson. No offense if your name is Benson. I just thought it was a funny thing. So with that being said, remember no space technology will be allowed in this society and anyone caught using it will be sentenced to serious punishment. She's threatened these people like several times. This is, she's like an anti-hero except like very unintentional. So I mean, Good for me, I guess. After she threatens the people for the second time, she says, and remember, there will be an 18th birthday party in the castle. It is for the first classers only, so remember to bring your money, people. <laughs> she threatens them, and then she's like, and remember, my birthday party tonight, but no poor people. You bring your money. Wow, what a great, great protagonist. And then she starts going into some stupid exposition about like why she did it for like the 10th time, even though earlier she said, I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> because I was a really good writer. His name is Benson Ovartin. And I remember I didn't know his last name until I literally wrote that down. And his ruthless companion, Zephyr Pedestriac. Pedestriac, I made that last name up on the spot too. I just remember like I would plot it, but I remember I actually started writing and I like realized I didn't give them last names. And I remember being like, uh oh, that's bad. We, we gotta fix that, right? Um, and then I just slammed my keyboard and I was like, Pedestriac. They come to Arlington every now and again and steal or even murder people. They steal important supplies and rig ships as their own. They are bad people. Very subtle. Can you imagine watching Star Wars and then all of a sudden all the characters are like, Darth Vader is so evil. Here is a list of all the things he has done. I honestly, I feel like Star Wars might have done that at some point. <laughs> so then she starts going into some really, really dumb exposition again. And we're on page six about how her mother became pregnant when she was like a couple years old. I don't know how she would remember that, but it was a healthy pregnancy. And then she had a sister. But then the 
baby died. And I remember I just like randomly wrote that because I was like, oh cool, backstory, but like it had nothing to do with anything. But then I remember randomly at the end of the book I decided that that was a big twist, which we will hopefully get to later. So she's bragging about how her room is huge and how her life sucks. I don't know why. I'm jealous of her, honestly. And she's like talking about how she um, was always alone growing up and how her best friend died of the plague. She was all alone and her parents were always so busy running the kingdom that she never had anybody and was always alone and stuff. And she's so neglected. And I walk out to my bedroom with my poofy pink dress on. I hate it. It's tied so tight around me and I feel as if I would pop if I took another step. Don't get me wrong, I love to dress up. Everything I wear are dresses and high heels, but this one is different. It's supposed to make me look like I don't eat or something, because she's a feminist icon, you know, no eating disorders here. But I remember I saw something on Tumblr, <laughs> and I remember I translated this stupid post into this book, and it was this random post, and it was like, I want to read a book about an action hero who wears dresses and, like, fights people wearing high heels. And I, I, I don't even think I'll be able to find that post, because... Again, this is in 2013, which is a minute ago. I remember being like, I'm gonna write a book about a princess and she wears dresses and fights. So throughout this whole book, she does in fact wear dresses during a battle scene. She gets to the party, she's complaining about her, how her life sucks. She walks out into the crowd. Who wants to dance, she announces. <laughs> People's hands go up and others cry out. Me, me. It was gonna be hard to choose. My one rule still sat. No jerks, no one who thinks they are better than anyone else, no one who is trying to suck up to the princess especially. Apparently she's got great intuition about that stuff. From nowhere a figure comes out and reaches for my hands, pulling me from the group. Sorry guys, looks like I'm taken, I laugh. What the heck? She's like, no jerks. And then some guy just grabs her and she's like, Okay. Seems fine by me. <laughs> Wait, what the frick? She says, His face is covered with a hood. Would I even see the face of this Prince Charming? What if I was to marry this person? Which is just subtle foreshadowing because they totally don't fall in love. Any young adult book published in 2013, I think it's the rule that like the first boy that they interact with is the person that they will in fact be married to. You seem like a natural, I say as I catch my breath. No response. I give the stranger a brief hug and make my way back up to the throne. He says, wait, Mary. The man's voice is thin, like a boy afraid for his life. Okay, so he's like, wait, M Mary. Nobody has ever called me that name. Mary wasn't my name. My name is Mary Sue. Are nicknames prohibited in this kingdom or something? The man's voice is sarcastic. I prefer my real name and that name only. I shoot him a look and I noticed that we're in the middle of the dancing circle. Let's move out of here so we don't get killed by these dancers. What kind of dancing are they doing? Some deep salsa with some knives, if you know what I'm saying. Would you like a drink, Mary? I'm angry that he says my name this way, but I answer anyway. If you will go away, yes and thank you. Cause she's so sarcastic. He pours the liquid from the bowl and into a small glass and hands it to me. Suddenly from behind me a shattering noise startles me and everyone around me. I turn abruptly and look at what happened. A shattered glass. Who would have thought? It's okay everyone. Just a broken glass, she announces. <laughs> I try to calm the people and a maid comes and sweeps it up and leaves. I feel like there's some subtle like slavery stuff going on because I don't think that these maids are being paid. I turn back and the man is still holding the drink. They Thank you, I say, and I take a drink from his hands. They have some weird banter where he's acting like Batman, and he's like, you can call me Raven for now. And she's like, what do you mean for now? And then he disappears into the night. And she's like, okay. She takes a sip, and she's like, mmm, this is good. It tastes like raspberry, right? Goes up back to the throne, talks to her mom. This is my favorite part of the whole book. She says, wow, he was so gentle. I hope to see him again someday. Oh, and by the way, mom, I love the raspberry drink. We we should make it more often, I tell her. Honey, I think you're confused. The drink in that bowl is sugar water with a hint of lemon. 
That is all I remember before darkness steals my vision, leaving me blind. That literally sounds like a line that I read in Zenith. <laughs> remember I didn't know how to like weave it into the story, so I was like, oh, she tastes something in the drink, but it's not actually in the drink, and she is, gets knocked out. And then she wakes up, and she's in a glass, like, incubator or something. It's basically like, um, like a tanning bed, except it's all glass. She's laying in there, like, Jesus style. And she's wearing, like, gray, like, space freaking like mechanical workers outfits, I think is what I'll compare it to. Mary, the voice says from behind me. There's a hood covering his face. I wonder who it is. Who are you? I shout at him while smashing my small hand into the glass. You think you don't know. You certainly do. When the hood comes off, Benson Ovartin. His dark brown hair and his eyes are a deep shade of blue. This man is evil. Again. Subtle, right? Why am I in here? I claw at the glass. You are more important than you know, Mary. <laughs> she an X-Men? Don't call me that. <laughs> I feel like there would be much, much more things I would worry about if I just got kidnapped. Like, that's not my name. Shut up. Where am I? Why am I here? How am I important? One at a time, honey. Don't. Dot, dot, dot. Call me. Dot, dot, dot. And then in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> because she is just the freaking worst. I explode into a ball of rage and attack the glass. Okay. Calm down, Mary. As soon as you calm down and listen to what I need to tell you, you can be free. Talk. I say him as I set my jaw. So she goes, talk. <laughs> I'm Benson. You know that. I've done some things that are mistaken as bad, when in all honesty, I have a reason for my misbehavior for your kingdom. Someone very important to me is trapped on Barnemdu. Barnemdu is like the evil person planet. And I do remember that I just sort of smashed my keyboard and was like, Barnemdu. You know what that is? That planet with all those weird creatures? I call my voice. For the most part, yes. The planet with all those weird creatures, but a great friend of mine who uh, has such high importance to me is trapped there. Her name is Zephyr, who is that evil chick from before. They're like accomplices. His voice pauses when he says her name. She must really be that important. When he says her name, his eyes have that same look. The look of sadness. The same look my mother gave me when we lost my sister. She's important to you? She is so very important to me. So, you need me? Why? I ask him. You can show the citizens of the kingdom that I'm not a horrible person that they think I am. I can show them who the real enemy is, which is an actual line from um, Catching Fire. Why would I believe that? So you can become a hero and save the kingdom, kill me and my family, and take the throne for yourself? I'm not buying it. If I could trust you, I would let you out, but I'm not sure I can do that just yet. He looks at me straight in the eyes. Literally, he just said, I don't trust you, and then she's like, please, and he's like, fine. I wonder if she's gonna attack him. No spoilers, but here we go. The glass goes down in an oval shape around me, so like an Easter egg, it's going down. I wrap the blanket around my shoulders and put my feet over the edge and let my bare feet touch the stone beneath me. Where is my dress? This also implies that he stripped her of her dress while she was knocked out. So basically he like almost in a way like date raped her. I don't want to joke about that, but yikes to that, right? There are some implications that I never really thought about when I was writing that. Um, but then again, I was like 14, so I mean... <laughs> Call me out if you guess. So she's free from her glass prison now. I wonder what she's gonna do. She's gonna be a rational human, right? No, 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 this is a young adult book. We don't do that here. I jump off my table and pounce Benson. He struggles, but in the end, I end up on top of him, pinning him down like I have power. There's a typo here. It says, little did her know I have no strength in my body whatsoever. So we know that she has no strength, but we also know that she is in fact a warrior. And then in all caps, why did you take me? Let me go! I scream at him. His face is shocked like he doesn't know how to react. His hands wiggle free and attacks me. He hits me straight in my nose, and I fall to the side, clutching it. He pins me down, his grip tightens to my wrists. And then there's a weird typo here that says, I smallly scream. Instead of like, I let out a small scream. I smallly scream, and he loosens his grip on me a small bit. Um, which I feel like is actually something that I read in um, a Colin Hoover book. I was never gonna tell you everything, but maybe not anymore. He calms his voice and it soothes me. That 
does not sound very calming. That is when I begin to sob. We know that his um, friend Zephyr got kidnapped, right? So here's the exposition about what had happened. She was kidnapped by Jamori. He wanted to rule Arlington. All those things I've done, murder, theft, <laughs> it was to protect the kingdom. Which just sounds like an excuse, probably because it is. Why does it sound like you're saying that to get on my good side? I laugh. It may seem like that, but it's true. I killed the man who was rumored to be helping Jamori get into the kingdom. It was confirmed, so I went and I killed him. I stole the ship from the palace because Jamori hired false, false, I put the word false twice, false, false workers to sneak into the country when they were heading back to Arlington. That doesn't even make sense. What the heck? If this man is trying to get into Arlington so much, why have I never heard of him until now? I say, trying to prove my point in some way. Have you ever wondered why your parents are gone so much? He looks at me strangely while he strokes his hand on my back, which I thought was flirty, but like in the context that like he roofied her, stripped her of her dress, kidnapped her, enslaved her in a glass prison. I feel like there are some things that are being unsaid here and there are some implications that I feel like are just way too hashtag me too, if you know what I'm saying. Let's get back on track. They were busy trying to find a way to protect him from getting in. They told you to make that law, correct? He asks. They did, but it was supposed to get rid of people like you. I try not to make him angry. You created the anti-space law because of me. I did that so you would all be scared of me. Wait, what the heck? I just remember I had no explanation about why this dude was like a good guy. I remember for a while I was like, oh, you know, he was blamed for all these things by this evil guy. But then right here, he just straight up says that he did it on purpose and he wanted it to look a certain way because Jamori was acting undercover or something not very well fleshed out like that. But it just doesn't really make sense. And like, I feel like in the end, there is a plot twist, not to give anything away right now, but there is some sort of a weird plot twist where some of the reasonings as to why he was being blamed makes more sense. But also, when you hear this character straight out say, like, here's why I did everything, that he like says he did it on purpose, it's, it's kind of weird. You know what I mean? It doesn't really work. <laughs> Then he tells her that he took her to this far out moon, far out into the galaxy. She freaks out because she's like, space travel is illegal, we can be killed. But I don't think they would kill the princess just because she's the princess, you know what I mean? So now she's gonna go outside and just kind of process what has happened and this new information she has learned and she's sitting outside and this moon isn't like a typical moon. Um, it's sort of like a very, very small moon. So there's like a lake out there or there's like a forest and there's a small little base where Benson and Zephyr have made camp. You could question like, Hey, wouldn't the gravity be all out of whack? Or wouldn't you need to wear like a space helmet or something to get oxygen? What are the odds that this rando moon has the same gravitational pull and the same like air quality as Earth? Like what are the odds of that? Um, I never really thought about that. So she goes out and sits on the beach and she starts to cry. And then guess who shows up to comfort her? <sighs> It's Benson. Insta love was like the thing, so I was like, we need to redeem this character right off the bat. Like, there's never gonna be a moment where she doesn't trust him. He starts to randomly be a completely different character. Instead of being like a broody bad boy, he starts to like be so sweet. And he's like, in my life, I've felt alone so much that it feels like my entire life I have been alone. That doesn't even make sense. Who's gonna get a tattoo of that quote, right? Uh, in a weird freaking way, she falls asleep on his shoulder. <laughs> Chapter 3, here we go. She wakes up, it's freaking boring and stupid, and I think they train a little bit. There's nothing really important that happens. The only thing you really need to know is that Mary Sue, at this point, is perfect. She is super good at training. When they train, she downs him very easily. They sword fight a little bit, and she masters him every time, even though she's never touched a sword or never fought hand-to-hand -hand combat, but she's the best, so... Moving on. Now he's taking her on a tour of the moon. It's really freaking boring. I didn't. I don't know why I put this in the book. Then she starts talking about her parents and stuff, and um, Benson mentions that like they think that she's dead. But within the plotline of the story, she took a drink and then she like wiped out 
immediately. I would understand if it was like, let's have a dance. Oh, let's go in this other room and chat for a second. And then like she gets knocked out and he steals her and flies away on a ship. But the fact that she wiped out in front of everybody in the room, how did they not notice that he took her? I feel like they wouldn't assume she was dead unless like he made an announcement that he was gonna kill her or something. Now she's emo because she's like, my parents think I'm dead. I'm sad. And then here's the end scene. It says, there's a light knocking on my door. I sit up. Who could it be? Oh, right. The only other person in this entire place. <laughs> Which is actually aligned in the book. That isn't just my sarcastic dialogue. What do you want? I ask Benson, who's wearing a strange outfit. Come with me. I need to go get a spaceship. And then this broody bad boy says, You can finally see space and see what my life is like. It will be so fun. We get to dress up in costumes and pretend to be people you aren't. You will be disguised. They won't know it's the not-so-dead princess. But doesn't she want to get home? That... I feel like if she, that doesn't make sense. They're on their way to Arlington, which it doesn't make sense because I feel like if he was like, let's go on an undercover mission, her first move should be, let's go, let's go to Arlington, yeah, we'll do this. And then the minute that they're down there, be like, I'm the princess, help, he kidnapped me, kill him, right? Makes sense to me. Um, but no, I think she has a crush on him, so they just kind of go for it. I have a low powered ship, but I need one that's gonna survive on a Barnem do. The ship I have isn't powerful enough to survive there, and we need certain controls to help us when we get there. And I, I like to note that the way that I spelled there, instead of it being there, is in over there. It's T H E I R. Over there. <laughs> like, as in belonging to. And then he goes on some exposition about what a Barvin is. And a Barvin is this evil, like, almost like a dragon. It's like, almost like a slimy creature. They can, like, possess somebody and take their form. And your eyes turn purple. This dude, Jamori, has an army of these Barvin. Then he's like, we're going to Arlington. She's like, I don't think I can go there. Everyone thinks I'm dead. Or I'm some monster who ran away. Why would they think she ran away? Didn't they all see her get knocked out? Didn't they think that she got killed? Why would they think she ran away? It would make sense if like she just disappeared with no trace. But the fact that she wiped out in front of everyone doesn't really, that doesn't make sense. Benson gives her like hair chalk or whatever. It makes her hair ginger because that's what Zephyr's hair looks like because he wanted it to look like he's with her. Skipping all of this stuff, it sucks. He says, Operation Steal a Ship while pretending to be Royal Guard the Go. Or Operation SSWPRG for short. I laugh even though this feels so ridiculous. She comes up with some stupid fake identity. Her name is Daya, like that vegan cheese brand. And she's like, I am in my second year of being a royal guard, as if she's like <laughs> in Hogwarts. I come from Articus, the town on the outskirts of Arlington. I am 20. Sounds convincing to me. They arrive in Arlington. For some reason, Mary Sue doesn't, you know, try to escape from him, which doesn't make sense at all. But anyway, they're, they arrive at this thing. They start filling out paperwork, being like, yo, the king and queen, they requested some royal ships. This isn't actually in the book, but I assumed it was because they were trying to find their daughter and were getting a fleet or whatever, right? So he's trying to get a hold of this very powerful ship, claiming that the king and queen ordered it. The tall man walks into the room again, but this time he is different. He holds a gun pointed right at my chest. Naturally, I put my hands up. Benson does nothing. See, he's just such a bad, bad boy. I know who you are. Put your hands up now. The police are on their way right now. Why does he have a gun if he isn't the police? Who is this guy? Benson and Zephyr the Outlaws. I know what you have done, and I am not afraid to put a bullet in either of your chests. We get dragged away on a small ship, and we fly away. <gasps> What? <laughs> Chapter five, they fly them to the castle, they're chained up. Mary Sue is like, they think I'm Zephyr? I, what the heck? Which, believe it or not, is supposed to be foreshadowing. Can you guess what the foreshadowing is? It's so stupid. Are you armed? The large policeman turns to me, answer or you will be hurt. No, I murmur. She should be lucky. She's finally on the opposite side of being threatened because we saw in the beginning she threatened those citizens with beheadings or whatever. So they're getting arrested, they're thrown into jail, and now they're being tried for murder by the king and the queen. And I just feel like any logical person would be like, I got kidnapped and now I'm standing in front of my parents 
and I'm gonna tell them like I am your child but no her parents don't notice and here's the mom the queen just going going ham on the two of them. As soon as we got informed that you two were caught, we had a celebration. You two have done such horrible things to our kingdom. I mean, it must be a pretty nice kingdom if the only thing they've done is like stolen a couple things and like killed a guy or two. You two are so horrible to this kingdom that James and I will do it ourselves. We will shoot you tomorrow with our own gun. My mother was gonna kill me. She didn't know it, but she was gonna kill me. A mother was supposed to recognize her daughter anywhere, but in this moment that I needed her most, she didn't. Doesn't make sense at all, right? Like, why didn't she say, Mom, I got kidnapped by him. You know that I got kidnapped by him. It's me. Like, she could easily say that, but like, they dyed my hair with some hair chalk, and I'm in the dungeons right now. I'm like, Mom, it's me. Please don't kill me. But no, she just goes along with it because she's just the freaking worst. And then they're put in like the dungeons of the castle. And she says, this sucks. It says, I rest my head down and I hear something hit the ground next to my cell. Dead mouse? Question mark? No. I look up and I see a jacket and she uses his um, jacket as a pillow. Because even though we're 50 pages in, I was like, they are in love. I shipped them so hard <laughs> a couple pages later. They're going out to be executed in like the big uh, town square or whatever, like a big open field. There are tons of people watching. The king and queen, they each have guns, and they're going to kill them. They're salty about what has happened. And then while they walk out, Mary Sue sees her gravestone, beautiful princess, loved daughter, and respected young woman. R.I.P. So they're walking out and then um, the royal guards start to announce the execution. Welcome everyone for coming to this event. Benson Ovartin has been an outlaw to this kingdom for years and now he and Zephyr, who is partners with Benson, have been caught and are going to be killed by the king and the queen themselves. This is an event that has been waited upon by so many people. The final straw for King James and Queen Larine. <laughs> Ooh, that ain't it. I made that name up on the spot. You, you know that. Was when their 18-year-old daughter, Mary Sue, went missing a few days ago and is rumored to be killed. So they're about to be executed, right? Um, and she's trying to think of an excuse or like something to stall for long enough or some, some way to get out of this execution because it's not looking so great for them. They both got guns to their head, right? Her mother puts a gun to her head, and she is gonna perform the execution on her. And she says, you have a family? Yes, I do. I lie to her. That's not a lie. Her mother is right there. I don't know why she's still going with her secret identity. I guess she's just really, really selling this role. She's like, I'm gonna die for this part. That's too bad, because I loved my daughter and you stole her from me. Let me see how your family feels. She shakes as she points the gun at my head. An idea pops into my head and I shout, wait, what do you want? Mercy, we can't give that to you, my father says. Your daughter is still alive. We kidnapped her and we brought her to her secret base. Give us proof, my father shouts. Why would you kidnap her? We wanted to know where the money was in the castle. We wanted to steal all your jewels. Benson's voice sounded strange. We just wanted the jewels. Okay, guys, sounds good to me. They're like, take us to her or you will be killed. And then they go on the ship Flight Bird, which I definitely made up in that very moment because what a name, right? So they're like, you take us to her now. And I feel like an easy way to not get executed and I said this earlier, but just be like, hey, it's me. No, no, no. They're flying, they're like pointing a gun at Benson's head and they're like, you take us there now. Now. You take us there now. And then Mary Sue has the brilliant idea why they're in this ship. Where is the bathroom, my queen? She says, down there. Remember, don't pull anything. We aren't afraid to kill you. <laughs> I don't know why the mom talks like that, but okay. Mary Sue is in the bathroom and she's like, I need to get out of there. And she doesn't flush herself down the toilet. That's not where we're really going, but she's in the bathroom. She's like, what do I do? What do I do, right? And she grabs a wrench from her back pocket, which she randomly grabbed in the scene earlier. I don't know why. And then she starts trying to loosen up the pipe in the toilet. Would a ship have plumbing? 
That's something I don't really want to talk about. Undoing this pipe, trying to get it off so she'd have some sort of a weapon to beat her with. Even though she's handcuffed, I don't know how you would really wrench. You know, I, I feel like it'd be very difficult to pull that off. I don't want to think about it too much. Logic isn't really important here. <laughs> and she's trying to yank it and it flies and she goes way back. She smashes into the door and then the queen yells, You okay? Yeah, turbulence, I guess. My voice trails off. Come out now. It has been far too long, she shouts at the door. I hear her leaning up right against the door. I slowly unlock it and open the door, hiding my secret weapon. I turn my head around the corner and see my mother. Then I swing. I hit her straight in the temple, and when Benson turns around to see what happened, he immediately elbows my father right in the nose. He falls to the ground and Benson kicks his head. <laughs> Yikes, just going ham on them, right? And he becomes unconscious for the next few hours. I look over to my mother and she lies down with a huge bruise right above her eye. Sorry, mom. And then he's like, great job. You got the pipe? Wow, couldn't have done it better myself. And so they just have the king and queen knocked out in the middle of the ship, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's some sort of a meteor or something, or like some sort of a comet that hits the window of the ship, the glass just shatters and they're gonna die, right? Because I feel like gonna suck all the oxygen out, everything's gonna get sucked out of this hole. But you know, logic isn't really important because she just grabs a tarp and holds it up to the hole and it's fine. Like we're not worried about anything. It's fine. They have their ship now. I think they like drop the king and queen's bodies back um, to Arlington and then they fly back up or whatever. And then they go back to their base or whatever and then they wake up and they're like, oh, we should do something today. Well, we should probably avoid Earth. We could go to the space mall. They have nice clothes there. The fact that they just straight up call it space mall, really cool. It could even be like a whole planet where it's just like super luxury and stuff like that, but no, it's just like called Space Mall. It's freaking weird, but that's fine. She's going shopping now, and they go separate ways to shop for different things or whatever. So she goes to this shop, which is called Dresses for Women. Everything in this store is obviously labeled. Okay, at least I was like aware of that, right? I see things like sports, even shoes for all. It is ridiculous. The label of the store is pink with a beautiful display of dresses around the entrance. She's like buying a couple dresses because she's a princess um, and then she walks up to, <laughs> this is really bad she walks up to the checkout right uh, this man is like getting these dresses he's like here are your dresses have a good day and he's not just some weird sassy gay alien he's actually um, the villain of this the series thank you so much sir I would love to tell the manager of this store your name what is it and then I look at the name tag sitting near the man's shoulder. It was the one name I would not want to see ever. The worst possible name I could see. Jamori. Which just doesn't make sense. Like why would the villain of the series be like, I'm gonna get a job at this space mall in hopes that my enemies will in fact show up at that space mall at some point in the book. Especially the shop called Dresses for Women and... What? That doesn't make sense, but you know what? It's young adult. It doesn't need to make sense. Okay, so it's the next day. Let's do this. I don't think I described what Jamori looks like. So here's the description of what he looks like because, yikes. He is very muscular. He has green skin because it's space. His hair is ginger, which believe it or not, that is also supposed to be foreshadowing. And he has the man bun because I don't know why. He just, that's how he likes to live his life. Without thinking, I make up an excuse that my friend needs me. Hold on, sweetheart, you forgot your bags. His voice is eerie, and I rip the large bags from his hand and leave as quickly as humanly possible. Before I know it, I'm dashing through the crowds of people to get back to the entrance. I accidentally hit a woman, and she drops her thing. Boring. I look through the, there's actually a typo, it says, I loom through the rows of people and I cannot even spot him. Did Jamori get him? How am I supposed to survive without him? Which, that doesn't really make sense because if you think about it, like, didn't she just run out of the shop? She just saw Jamori. He was there the whole time that she was in there. She talked to him. Why would she think that Benson got kidnapped? She starts freaking out and she's like, where is he? Oh no! But then she says, I see a figure slowly coming through the crowds of people. I wonder who it is. <laughs> Benson, she announces. I run towards him and I hold him in a tight embrace because I was really shipping it. And they get back to the spaceship and they're just hanging out and they're flying home. She says, guess who I saw? Who? Benson replies. Jamori. He was working at the dress place. He paid for my dresses. He seemed nice, but 
when I realized who he was, he became creepy. But like, I do appreciate Jamori because if you think about it, he really did play the long game there. He got a job at a dress shop and probably worked there for what I assume months just to get like a scary, you know, just to scare the main character. Good for him. <laughs> and then Mary Sue is freaking out. She's like, what if he gets me? What if he takes me? Like, he took Sephir. What if he kills me? And then here's a line that I feel like I've read in like a hundred different books. I will search the ends of the universe for you. I will not stop. I will not sleep until I know you are safe. Which doesn't really make sense because if you think about it, like, why are they in love? I didn't remember this passage, but um, she wakes up screaming. She runs out and she sees Benson sitting in the laboratory where she was in her little egg incubator thing, you know, what I'm saying and he sees a video that I'm assuming Jamori like tweeted at him or something I don't know how he got a hold of this video or if it was like a blackmail thing um, and it's a video of Zephyr getting like attacked by this Barvin and then Benson is crying and then he's like oh no we need to make a cure so then they start to plan um, that they're gonna make a cure so then when they get Zephyr they can cure her of her disease or whatnot and then Mary Sue is like no we can do we can go get supplies from Arlington my parents will understand you know we can explain everything to them and then I just have to think then why didn't they explain it when they were in Arlington like five Five minutes ago like the day before and then Benson is randomly like I need you to call me Ben now everybody calls me Ben and I prefer it that way okay four from Divergent <laughs> they're like hanging out on the moon or whatever and Jamori sends a note I don't know how he got the note there did he write the note get in his own personal ship fly it to the moon. We already know that Jamori is able to send videos to Benson, so I guess he's just really being formal about this. I killed your parents. They're dead. The Barvin ate them, and now they're evil, and they're dead. She just takes him for his word. Um, I don't know why she do that. She starts sobbing, even though she apparently resents her parents for some reason. I don't know why, but he's like, your parents are dead. It's been a rough day for those parents. Like, first they get knocked out, tossed out of a moving ship, and now they're just turned into evil creatures, and they're dead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I forgot about this. They go back to Arlington and she says, Mary Sue is like, I need to announce to these people that I'm alive. I'm going to explain everything to them. Um, like, they deserve to know what happened because she's just a charitable princess, right? Um, but also, if her parents were dead, wouldn't she be the new queen? That makes sense to me, right? She's going to go out under like the awning or whatever where she made her announcement at the beginning of the book about her new law or whatever. So she's like, okay, here we go. People, assemble, it is I. <laughs> she didn't say that, but in my head, that's what she's saying. Look, everyone, I am not dead. I was on a small dot 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 journey for a little while. All I get are blank stares. I know that there are many rumors that I am dead, and I need to tell you all an important message. The King and Queen are dead. Creatures from space killed them. Everybody seems shocked. How do we know you're not just saying that to get more power or something? A small man says from the room. <laughs> That's just the peak dialogue. Yeah, you uh, you aren't even the princess, another man shouts. Chaos erupts from the room and people are yelling at me saying that I am not the princess and that I am dead. <laughs> like, I feel like... It, it, all right. She goes out into the throne room because apparently now that she's in a different room, her, you know, her speech is going to have some different weight or something. She says the exact same thing. She walks out there and she's like, I know I've been gone. I know you think I am dead, but I have an important message. The king and queen are dead. She says the exact same thing. They're possessed by Barvin. She knows that. And also they're trying to get a cure. Doesn't make sense at all, but it's fine. Someone strange walks out in front of the small area and begins to talk. I dot 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 knew the queen and the king so well, he says with slowly stutters. Then from nowhere he explodes. A huge creature about the size of a monkey appears where the man stood. It has long yellow teeth and black wings that spread across its back. It has purple eyes and they seem to glow, so this is a barvin. That man, which um, was... 
I don't know why she didn't recognize him, but that was Jamori. And he was like, I knew the king and the queen so well. And then he attacks everybody with a barvin. Um, I don't know why he opened with that line as if it's like his thesis statement. That chapter ends, and now we're on part two. And the quote that I chose to open part two says, and you, you better run because I'm going to destroy you for what you have taken from me. Which is like a good quote, but I just feel like it's really too, too on the nose, you know what I mean? So he throws her into a cage and he says, looks like I am the ruler of Arlington now, sweetheart. No, you are not. I know this castle inside and out and I can get out of here easy. I try to sound cocky, but I just know I sound like a scared little girl. Sure you do. Now go play with your doll, little girl. Have fun in your jail. I will not feed you, so you must eat the dust that sits in the corner of the cage or even the spiders. His voice is evil and dark. <laughs> I don't know why he talks like that. Why do you hate us so much? I shoot at him. Everyone needs an enemy, dear. What? So his reasoning for doing this is just like, he just wants some friends, you know, just wanting to have a good time. Okay, Jamori. Elephetheria, I whisper under my breath. The word means freedom in an unknown language. The stone slowly shifts to the side of the wall. So she whispers this random word. And then the stones move apart and she can walk out of the jail cell. Because apparently her parents knew that this was going to happen one day, but they still are dead, so way to go, guys. But earlier, when they were going to be executed, she was in this exact same cell. Why didn't she do it then and then escape with Benson? But no. Consistency doesn't matter, apparently. She's running out, Arlington is in chaos, then she goes into the ship that is her and Benson's ship, and she's leaving. She doesn't even try to look for Benson. She just assumes he got dragged away and is killed or something. This is the part of the book where things go really out of whack. Benson is off, she thinks he's dead, she thinks he's kidnapped, she doesn't know what happened to him. She doesn't know how to fly the ship super well, so she, you know, gets her coordinates wrong or whatever, and she ends up on this rando planet. It's like a very tribal planet, you know. They live in huts and they're like very ceremonious people or whatnot. She meets a woman named Nini and her daughter Abley and they stay together and on this rando planet the men, they hunt for the food and they provide them for this tribe but the women aren't allowed to go hunting. So then she's hunting or something and like she falls down. She was covering her face and her hair and so like reveals somehow her hair and face. And then some random tribe dude is like, you know this is illegal and you are breaking the rules of Organo, right? I don't know why this planet sounds like some like Italian seasoning, but she says, I thought I could show women that they could hunt too, even though women aren't even around. And she's just with men. She even disguised herself. Like it would be a statement if she just went out and was like, I'm a woman and I'm doing this. But no, she like hit herself. And then this man brings her to the town square and he's like, we have caught a woman hunting in the woods. This is illegal. We need to decide what we're gonna do with her. She says, wait, I need to say something because of course she does. She says, I have been here for a short period of time now and I think you look down on women. I know that they should stay home and clean the house but they are people and they should be able to do what they wanna do. If women wanna hunt, let them. What a great speech. She's like, women are people too. Massive cheers. The chants begin. They say, what is your name, young lady? A tall, skinny man says. Mary Sue, I say boldly. And then they start to pronounce her name wrong and they're like, I don't even know how I'm gonna say this with the fake name that I've given her. But they're like, Mari, Mari. I am no longer Mary Sue the princess. I am no longer Mary the space traveler. I have become Mari the revolutionizer. <laughs> I have changed a nation. <laughs> because she just broke the rules and then just said, you know what guys, this isn't the best. And then they all listened to her. Feminist icon. I felt that. And then she, sa she says, I had saved these people from feminism on accident. I don't know if I knew what feminism means because I said I saved them from feminism. So she decides that she's gonna leave this planet. She's, she's stopped feminism from happening, which isn't really what I meant by saying that, but you know what, it's fine. She says, I need to go, I need to find Benson. And you can argue, like, why didn't she do that earlier? But she needed to liberate those women. So she's trying to leave this tribe 
but she realizes that her ship is very, very far out. So she's walking out, and then as she walks a couple miles out from this tribe, thick clouds start to form. She finds herself choking on it, almost embarrassingly like in catching fire when there's that fog that like burns your skin and stuff it doesn't like burn her skin but like she's like getting nauseated and she's like dying basically because of this fog she wipes out right she's probably gonna die right but no this is a young adult novel we don't do that here in like italics because maybe it's a dream she says there's a man and he approaches a young girl laying on a cloud she must be important to him because he runs to her he looks like he's being reunited with her he gets there, and he kisses her, and then she says, then I look, and the girl, it's me! The man is Benson! This is no dream! This is reality! How did Benson get there? And more importantly, how did he get there at that exact moment? And I also like to note, the last time we saw Benson, he was like, call me Ben from now on. But she doesn't do that. She still calls him Benson. Because I feel like I just forgot that that was something I did. I remember I thought I was so edgy when I wrote this. Um, and I was like, I push him off of me. What the hell? You are supposed to be dead. And he says, things outwork differently than I expected them to. And so she's like, I thought you were killed. What happened to Arlington? Because she just abandoned her people. Like, what a good queen, right? Like, I assume that she would, like, you know, try to fight for them, try to get Jamori out of her kingdom, um, but, but no. An older woman, she captured me, and she tied me up in her basement. She put me in a cage. Why do all these people own cages? Like, Jamori had a cage randomly. Benson was thrown in a cage, but you know what, it's fine. And I was locked up for so long, she held me hostage. I tried to get out, and then I tricked her, and I told her I had a gun. <laughs> what? He just tells this woman that he has a gun and she just is like open the door to take it and he just punches her or something it's really good and he says i had to kiss you to wake you up because it's apparently it's sleeping beauty now um and by this point we're halfway through the book so like i was really trying to get this romance to be a thing right because i was like i mean she trusts him and whatnot, but um, it's not very well done. So now they're like, we gotta go make that potion because it's been like some multiple days and we know that the king and queen were turned into Barvin. We know that Zephyr is a Barvin now. I and mean, I'm gonna start skipping a lot of stuff mostly because this is like so freaking boring. They're like reunited. They're like, we gotta go back to our base and do some research to figure out how to get the Barvin out of these people. Benson says, Mary, we can find a way. We'll get him out of your castle. We'll find a way for him to stop hurting the people we love. If he tries to take you away again, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she says, very subtly, she says, so are you saying that you love me? What? And then he says, Mary, it is impossible not to love you. I've traveled through all of space just to find you, and here you are next to me. I've always wanted you which sounds weird because he kidnapped her. I will never let Jamori touch you again. I promise you. I just like how quickly this whole romance happened. Like it really, really came out of nowhere. And we're getting close to like where actually good action stuff happens, but we have a lot of filler chapters and I'm just gonna skip over most of these. They figure out that there's this thing which is very cleverly called Moon Rock, which if you grind it up and then mix all this other stuff, it basically weakens a Barvin and the Barvin will be casted out of said person. So it's really boring and they're like, oh, we gotta find this moon rock, we gotta figure out what planet it's on. So Benson goes to the lab and he's trying to figure out, you know, planets and looking at their resources and stuff. I don't know if it's like on Google, but apparently he has the resources to do said thing. So Mary, she is like the best ever. She never has failed at anything. So she says, I'm gonna go train because she's trying to kill Jamori or something because she's bitter. Somehow, even though she's never ever thrown a knife, she hits the target right in the head, flies and it nails the target in the center. <laughs> Wow. They find out that on this planet named Frotis, again, made up in that very second that I actually typed it, they have Moon Rock as a leading resource to this rando planet, right? And also some other resources that are listed next to Moon Rock is iron. And then fish scale tree, which was definitely me, like, trying to think of something that was spacey. And they're like, we found it! We're gonna be able to make a- we're gonna be able to make the potion! And they have, like, space suits on with oxygen tanks. They go there, they grab the moon rock. It's actually the least exciting thing ever because since they have space suits on, they can't talk to each other. So they're literally like, we walk out and we grab the rocks and we bring them to the ship and then we walk out and we get 
And that's literally the whole chapter. So they get there and Benson's like, we need food. And hey, I heard that you could hunt because you liberated this rando country, Organo or whatever it's called. And he's like, you're able to hunt. So I want you to go out in the woods and I want you to hunt and get a deer or something because I don't know why deer live on the moon. That doesn't make sense, but it's fine. I'm not gonna focus on it because nothing matters anymore. Grabs a bow and arrow from the training room and keep in mind, she's wearing a dress right now. Like a big poofy dress. She says her um, dress is bright orange, which is a fashion statement by the way. And she says, oh no, like my dress got caught and it's ripped, oh no. Um, which was me trying to like think of a plot point, which we'll read in a second. So she's hunting, and all of a sudden she hears a weird sound, and then she feels blood trickling on her forehead. What could it be? It's a Barvin! Benson, come quick! I scream his name and I hear nothing in response but a light breeze hitting the leaves from my head. Barvin is attacking and she's running through the woods but, you know, she's all disoriented because she was so into her hunting and she doesn't know where to go. She's lost. But then, she sees the orange that ripped off from her dress so she knows which direction to go in. And Benson is standing outside of the woods where there's like the clearing and she busts out and she says, There's a Barvin! We need to try the potion! We have no time! It's right behind me! They made like a tester potion or something. Um, and now is the perfect opportunity to try to get this Barvin to not be Barvin anymore. So he grabs the potion, he just like, you know, very weirdly like, just dumps it onto the Barvin. Very slow moving creature apparently. And then all of a sudden the Barvin starts to scream and it starts to lay down on the, on the grass. And they're like, we did it! which is actual dialogue. That's not even me just saying that they say that. We did it! I look over at Benson with the biggest smile ever. But then, they start to notice that the Barvin is shifting back into a human, like the human that it possessed. She sees that it is her father! It is the king! She thought that he was dead, um, but actually he was just turned into a Barvin and he flew away or something. I don't know how. Like, what are the odds that he flew directly to this moon? And they carry him to the base and, you know, they give him some food, which apparently I, I thought they ran out of food and that's why she was hunting, but they give him some food and they tell him the rest. Surprisingly, this leads to nothing besides the fact that he's just like, he's here. So they're like, our potion works on the first shot. Who would have thought? The rest of the day, we do nothing. <laughs> That's literally a perfect example of this whole section like we did nothing I thought y'all were in a hurry like I thought that there was some stakes here But somewhere during this her father tells her that her mother is kidnapped by Jamori as well on his planet that he lives in It's like a desert planet kind of like Tatooine That wasn't really what I was going for because at this point I hadn't watched Star Wars, but for an idea, it's very like dry. And then they're like about to leave and then she says, wait, what about my dad? Because you can tell that I had forgotten that that was a plot point that had happened and that was something that we needed some closure on. And then Benson is just like, he'll be fine, he'll just sleep. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, let's go. This is really good writing. Benson whispers to me, we need to change. Change out of that dress. No, I tell him. We have to. It'll be easier if you just wear... I cut him off. I like to wear these dresses, and I feel most comfortable when I wear them. But, like, we're going on a desert planet. There's gonna be, like, sand dunes. You're gonna climb a, a sand dune in a dress and heels? This is, like, what I'm saying. You can wear a dress occasionally if you want. Like, live your life. I'm not gonna place what you're wearing. But when we're at a battle scene, and you're wearing a dress... But she's a feminist, so she must in fact wear what she wants because she is in fact a feminist. She liberated Organo. They got on their spaceship. They're like, we're gonna go to Barnimdu, let's go. Their ship lowers in this valley, and they're like, okay, we gotta climb up these sand dunes. Jamori has this big castle built. There are Barvin flying around. Oh, yikes to this. I forgot that this happened. So they get there, and they land. They grab this giant, like, cooler, like basically like a cooler when you go to like the beach or something, like a cooler full of these potions and they take them out and then all of a sudden these Barvins start to swarm at them. They're going around, you know, like almost like Dementors, how they kind of like just like see what's going on, you know? Barvin come from nowhere, Benson runs inside the ship, he hits this button, he runs out and he says, get out of here, go! Ten seconds later there's a countdown, the ship 
explodes and all the barbin die and they go flying back and all this stuff because um, they were that was his plan to kill the barbin that had been sent to kill them and then Benson just calmly says we can get out of here now and keep in mind she's wearing high heels and a dress right now and they're hiking up sand dunes I don't know if you ever hiked up sand dunes but it is a very difficult thing and it's even a very difficult thing when it's like midday which is what's going on right now and like the sand is really really hot you know you get sweaty easily like you even have to like ape crawl up sometimes but this girl is wearing high heels what the actual frick is going on so he gives her a dagger and he says we need to split up Benson tells me as he pulls out a sword I feel like this isn't a good idea I say immediately he says I have to save Zephyr I know how to move around this place without being seen and you can scope out the territory just make no one sees you coming in or out you can be safe out here he says we'll meet back out here in 10 or 20 minutes depending on how bad the barbin are inside I picture this as like part of the climax of this book right like we're finally going in all the things that we've been building up to they're gonna resolve right and then instead of uh, Mary Sue going in and helping Benson is just like, you stay here. I'm gonna go get her. And then she's just standing outside of the building while he does it. What a feminist, right? And she's standing outside. She says, five minutes pass, then 10, then 20. And then I give up. Benson is dead. I need to go in there and save him. Then we reach part three. And here's a, um, the quote that I chose to open part three. Confession is not betrayal. What you say or do doesn't matter. Only feelings matter. If they could make me stop loving you, that would be the real betrayal. And that's from George Orwell. I wonder what's gonna happen. Maybe there's gonna be some betrayal. Very subtle, right? <laughs> she says it's very silent, that her footsteps are echoing throughout this beautiful, beautiful castle. There are staircases everywhere. She starts walking through, she's holding her dagger, and then she sees a picture of her mother. She's like, why would Jamori have this? She's like, it's because he was plotting her murder or something, right? Here's where we start getting into some twists, right? I hear the words coming from behind me. Mary Sue, the voice says calmly. That doesn't make sense. She says, I turn around, and then I turn around and I see my mother. She's alive, but why is she not a Barvin? How is she alive without Jamori killing her or using her against me? What? I thought, what is all of this? How are you even... My words seem to trail off and I run over to my mother and give her a hug. She wraps her arms around me, but it feels differently than it normally does. She seems stiffer. I know that this may seem a little bit confusing, my mother says. And then another figure comes out from behind, Jamori. Mom, run, I scream, and I expect her to get up and run with me, but she stands perfectly still and doesn't even seem to notice Jamari behind her. Mary, my mother tries to talk to me, but I do not let her continue. He's a murderer. Get away from him. Mom, come on. I scream at her, but she still acts like there's nothing happening. This might seem strange to you, Mary Sue. My mother speaks so calmly it sends shivers down my spine. Jamari and I are married. I grab the picture frame from on the wall and I throw it at my mother. The painting flies at them, but they jump out of the way and it shatters. <sighs> okay. Nice try, Mary Sue. I'm not stupid. Jamori speaks to me and I still cannot comprehend what has even happened. And then he reaches out to her and he says, Don't touch me. Mom, explain this to me. What is going on? All right. My mother's words sound like they always have. When I was your age, we got married, but... Your father got in the way and ruined everything because it's like a dark thing where he was like, this is a pretty girl that lives in Arlington. I'm going to marry her. And it's almost like a forced marriage. Um, but she was already secretly married to Jim Mori. So she's like double married to them. And she like secretly resents the king um, and all of that. So she says that me and Jamori, we got secretly married, and then I got pregnant, but it was with the king, and she had uh, Mary Sue, but she secretly resented her, which is why that relationship was super strained, because she hated the king and all of that. But then, she gets pregnant again, but this time it's with Jamori's child, and I wonder who that child is, right? Mm. But when it came time for me to have that child, I sent it to live with Jamori. So I told you and everybody in the kingdom that that baby had died, so that's her half sister that had died and had been mentioned earlier. Stop lying to me. Everything you say is a lie. I can tell. I don't know how she can tell. I hate her so much. And this is when we find out that guess what everybody? Zephyr is in fact Mary Sue's half sister. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Which I don't know um, if my foreshadowing was super on the nose just by being like, this girl is a ginger. 
And guess who is also a ginger? It wasn't planned from the beginning, but then I remember I got halfway through and I was like, this would be a cool twist. Benson walks into this room and he has Zephyr with him and he's holding her or whatever. Like she just, I assume she was in a jail cell or something, which doesn't make sense why she'd be in a jail cell because I thought that Jamori was her father and the queen was her mother. Like I would assume they would just be living their lives or whatever and that Zephyr would be secretly evil, but no, she was actually captured, which is really weird and doesn't really make sense. Jamori says, Benson lied to you. Benson, what is he talking about? I look over at him. I have no idea. He's gonna try to lie to you. Remember, I'm your friend. Don't let him trick you. Benson sounds unsure of what Jamori could possibly be talking about. Benson has lied to you, Mary Sue. He doesn't love you. Yes, he does. I try to fight his words, but they continue. Has he told you? Surely he hasn't. And then he says, he is engaged to Zephyr. Have you ever wondered why she's so important? Have you ever wondered why he needed her to be rescued so bad? It was because he loved her. They're engaged. You're a replacement. So he dragged you into it. He lied to you. So we find out that this snake had lied to her and that he was secretly engaged to her half-sister, but he didn't know that it was her half-sister. Piping hot tea. That's what I'm talking about. It is some tea. Like, I feel like there were some good twists. I definitely feel like the execution wasn't there. And I do feel like there are only good twists because even I the author didn't see them coming until I actually wrote them in this very moment. And then Benson's like, it's true, I'm sorry. Like, I, I just, I didn't, I never planned for me to fall in love with you, but it happened, you know, and whatever. It's really, really bad. And so then she's like mad at him, but she's also feeling so sad because she was lied to. She's mad at Zephyr. She feels betrayed. And then Jamori takes out his gun and he shoots Benson right in the chest. And that's the end of that chapter. Just as the gun goes off, I'm on top of Benson, holding my hands to his heart, blood pouring out of him. She grabs the knife that Benson had given her earlier, and she chucks it at Jamori, and divergent style, she throws the knife perfectly at him, where the knife goes through his ear and sticks him to the wall and he's stuck to the wall with the knife and then she grabs Benson and like drags him out. But I don't know how she has perfect aim either, but whatever. So now that Jamori has a knife through his ear, he's pretty much just helpless. Instead of like fighting or trying to take the knife out and attacking them while they make their escape, he just is like, Oh man! <laughs> and the queen, by the way, she is never mentioned again. She's just hanging out. So for their escape plan, Zephyr and uh, Mary Sue, they grab Benson. Um, they're putting pressure on his wounds or whatever. They drag him into Jamori's ship. And she says, Zephyr, do you know how to fly this thing? We need to get back to our moon planet and we need to save him. So they fly away. Zephyr's controlling the ship. But while she's holding the wounds, Zephyr comes over. She punches Mary Sue and she's like fighting her, you know, and it turns out that Zephyr is a Barvin. There's been a Barvin living inside of her. Her eyes are bright purple and somehow Benson just didn't notice. Even though I'm just now realizing that it was said that there was a Barvin in her in scenes earlier. It's really, really messy. Mary Sue, you know, she can't do anything wrong. She's the protagonist, so somehow she best Zephyr. Zephyr is unconscious um, and then she decides that she has to fly the ship to the moon and get Benson to safety, right? So she flies there, they get to the moon, she drops everything and she runs over to Benson to see what he's doing because she hasn't been able to hold his wounds because she's trying to get to the moon so then she can treat his wounds as best as she can. And then she walks over to him and she sees that he is dead. Benson is dead. <gasps> Wow, what a risky move, killing off the love interest, but also, do you think I actually had the guts to kill him off? Let's see. And she's crying on the beach of the moon, and she decides that she is going to kill herself, which is a little bit insensitive, and so she tries to drown herself, but then she randomly, as she's about to die, she's like, hope! She swims back up, and she goes up. It's really, really bad. And then she goes out of the water, and um, she walks over towards the dead body. And then all of a sudden, she hears a cough. <gasps> Whose cough is it? It's Spenson's cough. He's alive. What a beautiful scene. Wow. I just remember I didn't know how to make him be alive again, so I just decided that he was going to be alive again. Zephyr is a Barvin still, and Benson has somehow made a full recovery. I don't know how, because magic, apparently. So it makes um, Mary Sue really sad, because Zephyr and Benson spend the night together, 
in the room opposite of her room. And she wakes up, and Zephyr is choking her! So they're fighting, and she's a Barvin, and oh no, everything sucks! Um, and so she's screaming, even though her windpipe is closed. I don't know how she manages to scream. And somehow in this strangling, Mary Sue somehow flipped Zephyr over and was now like pinning her down and hitting her or something. And Benson bursts into the room because he hears um, Mary Sue screaming. Um, and then he sees this event, right? He has a gun. So his first move should be to separate them. But no, he grabs his gun and he shoots Mary Sue in the shoulder. And there's just a lot going on. Like once we get to the climax, things just slowly start to not make any sense. Oh yeah, I, I forgot about this, but Zephyr gave um, Benson an antidote and that's how Benson survived. I guess I missed that while I was skimming. That's why he's fine, sorry for forgetting that. But then her father, her father is still here by the way. Um, he's just, been sleeping apparently all this time, even though so much has happened since we last seen him. The antidote Zephyr gave him makes him forget who you are. Um, so now he has amnesia because apparently we needed an amnesia plotline. So basically everything that has happened since the beginning of this book has been wiped from his memory, which is funny. So chapter 22 begins and uh, things aren't looking so hot for our friend Mary Sue here. Her lover not only forgot her existence, but he also is engaged to somebody else and her mother is married to the villain and just things aren't looking so hot for her. She just got shot in the chest. <laughs> Chapter 22 begins and she says that a month has gone by. She says that her bullet wound has healed so that was a really, really dramatic plot line that happened. She just was like, I'm shot! I'm fine now. But since she got shot, her father, who was up on that moon, by the way, just hanging out with them in the squad, just like not even doing anything, just hanging out. And I love that. For like days and weeks, I assume, him just being like, so, uh, it's pretty tense, you know what? So, because she got shot, that next day, her father tells her, like, we're going back to Arlington, we're gonna try to figure out what's going on, we're gonna retake our kingdom. He's just saying, like, obviously you can't trust Benson or Zephyr anymore, so we need to go. I don't know how they get there because there's only one spaceship there, so I'm assuming that they're just basically screwing Zephyr and Benson because now their only ship is gone. She's saying that life has gone back to normal, and you might be thinking, to yourself. How did life go back to normal? Didn't Jamori um, stage a coup and like start messing up Arlington? That's what I thought too. But then we get there and some royal guard just straight up says that like he was just like yelling at people for a while and then he went back up to space. So that was just the entire plot line dropped and forgotten. So yikes to that. She's saying that she really, really misses um, the moon and being with Benson, but she's also very hurt by what has happened. It's really boring and it goes on for a long time. There's an actual title drop where she says, I missed being the ruler of the stars which is just great. So then she sits down with her father, they go out into like the beautiful fields of Arlington, they start to have a heart to heart. Her father says, I know things have been hard, Mary Sue, but you need to get used to your life now. Things are different and I'm not gonna let you go back to that base. You know how dangerous it is now. He almost killed you. But then she says, Dad, I'm, I'm in love with him. And he cuts her off. He doesn't even know who you are. He's forgotten all about you. He has a fiance. And by now they're probably married already. She says, I at least need to try, Dad. Things don't always work out how you want them to. Did I know I was marrying someone who was actually in love with the person trying to kill my daughter? You can't just know those impossible things, Mary Sue. She breaks the news to him that she was the one that was going to be executed earlier in the book. And then he's like, what? I, I almost killed my own daughter? Oh my gosh. But none of them bring up the fact that she easily could have just said that it was her. And then he apologizes for being so distant from her and tells her that he loves her. It's kind of cute, but also the writing is not good. Her father told her, like, you're not gonna go see Benson, you know, he's in love with somebody else. Um, he lied to you, he hurt you, you need to give it some time to heal. She agrees with him, she goes up to her room, but then when nighttime comes, she sneaks out of her room, she goes to the ships, and she steals the ship, and she goes back up to the moon where she wants to find them. She lands down, and she's preparing herself. She's like, I don't know what's gonna happen. Benson might attack me, Zephyr might, you know, pull something. She doesn't really know what's going on, but she decides that she's gonna try her best. So she walks inside of the base, and she sees Benson and Zephyr sitting together, and Benson says, 
Mary Sue? And then she looks up at him, she's like, wait, does he remember me? How would he remember? Like, how would he know my name? And he's saying it in like a kind way. And she hugs him and she's crying because he remembers her. And then Zephyr, she goes and she rips him apart and she says, stay off, princess. And then Benton asks why she's there. He says, have you come to see our wedding? And turns out, it's their wedding day! <laughs> oh man, this is actually some piping hot tea, but it's just really poorly done. So somehow she showed up at this base at the perfect moment, because they're like, we were just about to leave for our wedding, like right this very minute. <laughs> so then they like go off and change into their wedding clothes. I don't know why, but she goes into like the bedroom. She goes into Benson's bedroom. And then she sees in the garbage can a pregnancy test, and it's positive, and that means Zephyr is pregnant. And she is in love with the father. So then they're going to this other far out planet And that's where the wedding will be held and so they go inside and they start to have a ceremony uh, Mary Sue is sitting here and she's like really depressed honestly And then um, the man that's performing says you may now kiss the bride Benson and Zephyr lock lips it is now set in stone. They are married and expecting a child. As if they weren't expecting a child and like, if they weren't married then the child would not happen. She says, people cheer and some scream for joy. I cry because of sadness. That doesn't make sense. Why would there be a lot of people at this wedding? Because for what I understand, the two of them were seen as like fugitives to Arlington. Maybe the rest of the planets were like cool with them, you know? But who are these people? But they kiss, they're married, she's crying, and then all of a sudden, Gunshots! Guess who's here? I wonder who it is! <laughs> That's Jamori. But it says Jamori has crashed the party! Mary Sue, she drops down. Everybody, you know, there's gunshots everywhere. People are screaming and running. Mary Sue hits the deck. And then all of a sudden, Zephyr goes into her true Barvin form. And she's like a giant creature. And she starts like wiping out people. And she goes over to Benson. And she bites him. And then he like falls over and he's like knocked out. Out and he's like looking like he's dead. She starts freaking out. Jamori is like gunning down people. Jamori um, like goes up to fight Mary Sue, right? And he says, nice to see you again, Mary Sue. I don't know why he talks like that, but I think it's funny. What do you want? You need to stop this. What are you planning to do? Why are you doing this to us? I need revenge. You have destroyed everything, he says. But what is she destroyed? What is, what, like, no, she did nothing. Then Jamori is like, Zephyr is my daughter, and I had her with the queen, and you two are sisters! Ha 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 ha! Mary Sue is like being pinned down by him. Say goodbye to your daughter then, I say firmly. What are you talk? Then, my hands go free and I reach for the dagger that is looped in Jamori's belt. I grab it, and then I stab up. Jamori's eyes widen and he looks so much different. He rolls off of me and I sit up. He gasps for breath on the ground and his eyes slowly close. I have killed him. <gasps> Tea. Then she looks over at Benson and he is dead for the second time in this book. She crawls over to him in the chaos. Tons of people are dead. She crawls over to Benson and she says, Benson, please wake up. And then he opens up his eyes and they're purple. He is a Barvin, which would be a cool way to end the book, but it goes on for longer. She runs to their spaceship, but it's locked and Benson has the key. She's trying to get into the ship because that's where the potions are that will stop the Barvin disease basically and make him normal. Benson, please, I need to get into that ship. She's banging on it. And then he says, why? You just want to kill me. And then she says very convincingly, uh... Zephyr is trapped inside. The only way to save her is to let me in. Save her now, Benson says in a tone that is not his. All right, I slowly walk towards the ship door, and the entire time Benson stares at me with a death glare. She grabs a potion, she turns around, and Benson's holding a gun at her like a giant weapon, right? And know what I'm just now remembering is the fact that this end scene is exactly like the same ending of Divergent. You remember that where Four was like being controlled by that weird serum? And then she's like, please, I love you, don't kill him. And then he like wakes up out of it. So then he shoots and then she is apparently Wonder Woman and like dives out of the way behind like some crates and stuff. She's shouting, Benson, listen! He keeps shooting at her but she doesn't get hit. And then her perfect plan, right? This is actually a terrible plan and it's stupid. She has one potion. So then she looks, she peeks out from the crates and she's like, okay. She sees that he's about to pull the trigger. So she chucks 
the the potion right at him, right? And then he shoots, and the potion explodes over him. Mary, his voice breaks through. Benson, I jump and I dash towards him. Our lips meet and it feels so right, but so wrong. Cause he's married now. <laughs> they go up to the ship. She says, Zephyr's gone, but she's also pregnant. My father will help us. My mother is out there somewhere and she won't forgive me for what I've done to her lover. <laughs> That's a weird way to put it, but okay. And then the last line is, we just need to wait. Bad things will happen in the future, but we just need to fly forward. The bad things will come to us. End of book one. We did it. We finished the book. <laughs> yeah, I've literally been filming this video for two days. But it looks like I'm done with that masterpiece. Um, although I do think it was pretty rough. I do also think that like I'm very happy for what that book did for me, you know, because that was the first book that I ever wrote. I do definitely think that this is a step in my writing life. I've definitely gotten a lot better. Don't go thinking that I still write like this. But that is all for this video. I gotta go edit this for endless hours now. Make sure to subscribe to my channel because I post videos on Tuesday. Y'all wanna go, go to Space Mall after this or what? Gotta get me some dresses for women. <laughs>